In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. And direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee, be happy in the true Christ, star Lord. Amen. Amen. Mary, help of Christians, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. I find it somewhat interesting that if when you um, <clears throat> look at the image that was painted, and actually the description given by St. John Bosco, of the end times, where you have Our Lady on one pillar, the Eucharist on another, but that, that if you look into the name of Our Lady on the pillar, you know, where the, the uh, and the boat, of course, has the Pope on it, it's going through very treacherous times, and the, the title underneath there is Mary, Hope of Christians, which the Auxilium Christianorum, which is the, um, uh, the title that they gave her was because of the fact that they gave her that title because she had helped them conquer the Muslims. So I find it interesting that at the end times there was some reference to that. So, anyway, okay. You can hold on to your questions at the end of this conference. We'll actually open it up to questions. I've got, uh, this will be a slightly shorter conference, so we'll have time to answer some of the questions. So in this conference, we actually want to talk about the, uh, how you identify the possible generational spirit within your family. And there's essentially two ways. The first is uh, natural, and this natural way in which you do it includes several things. Now, I do not, there's a variety of different ways it's done, but one of the principal ways is that you can look at the consistent patterns in the generational line. So, for example, if you notice that each successive generation had a problem with depression, or, and you can actually watch it come to the generational line. You can all, or if they had a particular problem with anger, usually anger isn't the problem, usually there's some other thing like unwillingness to suffer or something of that sort that's at the root of that. But there's usually some pattern that you'll see coming through the generational line. <clears throat> you have to be careful about that, as I mentioned before, because the demons can obfuscate, they can cause this thing to where it looks like it's one thing when in point in fact it's actually another. So again, what you see, the common problem they're all having, you have to know what's at the root of that. So you're looking for the patterns. <clears throat> so you see a particular, and the patterns are looking for particular sins and vices. That's what you're looking for. Because that's what he drives. So you're looking for those specific things that they all seem to kind of suffer from. But, so that's, again, if you know the sins and the vices, though, you also need to know then the second thing, which is, what are the roots of these specific vices? So actually, knowledge of things like um, the, um, the cardinal virtues, then also the, car or the, uh, <clears throat> the deadly, seven deadly sins, which are actually the seven deadly vices. And then underneath them, what are the specific things uh, underneath that that you have to be watching for. So you're actually looking for then what they call, um, uh, you're actually looking for what the root of this thing is. And in that, knowledge of the virtues and vices is really key. But the roots, you're actually looking for what they call the daughters. Look at this. There are certain vices of which there is a, they call them the daughter, the filia in Latin. And it basically just means that it's the thing, it's the vice that tends to flow from that particular vice. This will help you to get to this root thing and what you're seeing in the patterns. So for example, last night I mentioned that the primary vice in the United States is avarice. Uh, that's, that's, our, that's the spirit of our country. It drives several other kinds of difficulties. The first is, is fraud, St. Thomas says. That's why I mentioned fraud. Let me just give you an example of the fraud. When you go to get a loan uh, at a bank, the bank, when it gives you the, the money for the loan, it's called fractional reserve lending, it only has to have in its bank account 10% of the money. The government allows that when they lend the money based upon the regulations that they do it, they only, the bank only has to give 10% of the money and they're permitted to literally add a zero to that account and give you that money. They're literally creating money out of thin air. It's fraud. 
That's, that's what we're talking about. That's how that works. Most people are completely unaware of this. Okay. This is a classic, and so if you look at our actual, uh, the actual way in which our banking system is, the entire banking system, our entire economy is based on fraud. The entire thing. When you get down to the various ways in which it's done. The same thing is, is in relationship to the, the, the paper money. The paper money, or money, actually, there's nothing backing the thing. The thing is meaningless, ultimately. It's just that what they're, what they're banking on is your credibility that this stuff will actually give me what I want. Okay. So you're looking for the specific dollars. So like if you're looking for things like uh, intemperance, intemperance can have a variety of different dollars. So if you see the dollars, like if it's lust or things of that sort, sometimes the root vice is more something like as I'm, uh, is an unwillingness to put a su or an unwillingness to suffer for going something. Lack of longanimity, which is the virtue in which we can wait for something. Most people say I'm impatient. Well, patience actually deals with evil things, being able to deal with evil things for long periods of time, whereas longanimity is the virtue in which I'm capable of awaiting the good. So people will go to, um, they're driving down the road, they get to the stoplight, it's, nobody's moving for long periods of time, they start getting frustrated, right? That's why I actually sign off on certain parts of Europe, they're actually doing away with all traffic lights and going to roundabouts. They found it cut down 80% of the road rage they count out that they tracked it back to people sitting, not moving for long periods of time. Okay. Which is why I would not recommend moving to Los Angeles because you sit in traffic for long periods of time, not moving. Okay. Actually, maybe the people out there are a little bit more virtuous than I think that they can tolerate that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you're looking for the specific daughters. Why? Because he's got, the daughters are the things that you're going to see, the daughters. So when you see things like the anger or you see other kinds of things, those are only the sign that there's probably something underneath it, this more root vice. That's what you want to start looking for, what's underneath it. And so a really good knowledge of the virtues and the vices will help you to identify very quickly what this actually is. As an exorcist all the time, people come in and say, this is the problem I'm struggling with. So then I'll just immediately go to, okay, that's the daughter. They're struggling with chastity. Do you have a problem with fear, depression, or despair? Do you have a problem with one unwillingness to suffer? Right. So you have to kind of start looking at, um, you know, is the chastity a way of medicating yourself, or is it just a form of intemperance where you just don't want to be separated from pleasure, etc.? So you have to look for the thing that's underneath it, and that's likely where he's going to be hiding. Likely. Okay. So you're looking at the patterns. You're looking at the roots. And then the other, uh, so that you're looking at stuff that's just purely on a natural level, stuff that you can kind of sort out on your own. The difficulty with this is, is that, uh, well, two, there's two difficulties that can arise. The first is, is that it's, it's very unreliable. When it comes to the spiritual side of things, we are blind as bats. And that's, the biggest mistake people make is, you know, when people come up, one of the, as an exorcist, I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me and said, I have a gift of discernment of spirits. Oh, do tell. <laughs> and then the first, and then, and literally, I, I don't, I'm not joking when I say this, I can flip a coin and get better statistical outcome than what I'm going to get from the information from them. And the reason being is because of what? Because of the fact that the, um, a lot of times it's just based on emotion or whatever. It's not based on anything spiritual. Rarely have I found somebody who actually has it, really has it, okay. But that all being said, we're very blind. So when it comes to solving cases of possession, I have six academic degrees. They have not helped me solve one single case. Every single case that's ever been solved is a specific grace is given to see what the demon's doing, what his name is, or what's going on. God has to reveal this stuff on the other side because it's, there's so many varieties and variables that we just don't know. So guessing at it isn't helpful. Okay. The second part of it is, is that tracing the roots back to the... Uh, this can sometimes be difficult if you don't know much about your lineage. Usually people can't get past much back past their grandparents. So in the case where um, this woman was possessed and it was a generational spirit, it was five generations, and that it was the spirit who had to tell us how he got into the generational line.
They knew nothing about the ancestor. It wasn't until this demon said something, they went back and did the research and found out that this guy was a particularly evil man. Okay. All right. So this is one of the, the, the things that you have to really look for. The third thing you have to do is, it's a general principles of discerning the spirit, so you have to watch your interior motions. Now this hat comes with two things. In other words, the first is, what am I suffering? What do I feel inclined for? Now, this isn't, again, not necessarily your predominant fault. It could be, I'm angry all the time. That may not be your problem. Your problem is you may just, you just don't want to suffer. Maybe that's what the real issue is. So, you have to look at the interior emotions and then kind of get behind them and ask our lady to reveal those with them that we're going to talk about. But, so the first thing is you have to watch yourself. What am I, what's, what am I dealing with? If you're doing daily meditation, which is one of the spiritual things, so we'll just add that right now. One of the spiritual things you can do is do daily meditation. Why is daily meditation so important? When you're doing the daily meditation, the lower faculties calm down, which means they become more sensitive to the interior motions. The other thing is, too, is they become more ordered towards God because as you're thinking about God, they become ordered towards God, the lower faculties. And so when something contrary to that comes in, they're much more sensitive to it, and so they'll react more. So doing daily meditation will help you to become more sensitive so that you can discern stuff more interiorly. Okay. The other part of the difficulty is, is that you have to look at yourself in addition to the people outside of you. But the biggest mistake I find is people will come to me as a family that's struggling with difficulties and she'll sit there and recount all the problems in his generational line. And then he sits and recounts all the problems in her generational line. So the first thing I have to do is say, okay, you go to your corner and you go to your corner and I'm taking the ring from the, the bell from the boxing ring away so you guys can't, you know, box. Okay. In other words, you have to look at yourself and see if you see those patterns in the other, in the other people and in them uh, in your line. One of the things that can, a uh, way to discern it is when the, um, when you've kind of discovered it, you know, that it comes, say, say it comes to the mother's generational line. You can actually go to the father and ask him, have you ever suffered from this problem? Once in a great while, they'll say, not until I met your mother. Okay, by the way, I'm not blaming the wife, or it can, because it can be vice versa. But you can see that, again, because the demon gets in, he starts picking at everybody involved, and so he'll actually start affecting the husband or the wife in that process. And so that's one of the things that you can take a look for, because then you can say, okay, he didn't have a problem with this, so it didn't come through his generational line, it came through hers. You're looking at causation, basically, too. What would, be, what, what would be the mechanism that could possibly be passing this particular problem? Is it verbal abuse? Is it something else? Etc. Why is it being passed? Okay. So these are some of the natural things that you can actually do to discern what's this thing that's coming through there. Now, some of this is also good, too, in just discerning, you know, what are the psychological patterns of my family that are unhealthy and we need to get cleaned up? So, okay. Now, this is important because a lot of times, and this is the difficulty with our vices, with our vices, when we choose something according to our vice, we're choosing it under the aspect of the good. So over the course of time, we start thinking that the thing is good. So that when we start thinking, when people come to me, you know, I just don't know any of my vices. The point being is, is that when we choose stuff, we become blind to it because we think it's good, but we're not able to see the evil of it and the damage. So one of, that's one of the things why we recognize, we have to recognize I'm going to be blind to this thing. But sometimes we can see it in other people, so we can see it if it's in the actual generational line. As I mentioned, sometimes it skips, so sometimes you're not going to be able to see what that actually is, so it's going to be a little bit difficult. So in the spiritual side of things, this is the other side, so you've got the natural, then you've got the spiritual. In the spiritual side of things, first thing you want to do is start doing the meditation so that you become more sensitive to it. This is also important in order to be able to discern the subtleties of grace. People who meditate every day will very quickly be able to discern when something is emotional and when something comes from grace. Those are two distinct motions. 
God does not move us through our emotions. Let's be clear about that. What he does is, in fact, the definition of grace, the, the two effects of grace is that it enlightens the mind and strengthens the will. There's nothing about the emotions in there. So as soon as people, this all, by the way, came via the Protestants. There's this guy named um, Schleiermacher who said that, he said, piety is pure emotion. So by that, after that, everybody just started paying attention to their emotions and how they felt. They thought that was God, which is obviously not the case. So when people are discerning God's will, usually they're just talking about what emotionally they want rather than what are the subtleties of God's grace. But as you meditate, the emotions quieten down, and so you're more able to see how God's enlightening your mind or inclining your will in your choice. So that, because God's grace very often, sometimes it's like St. Paul, it just whacks you and you're blind for a while. But usually it's very subtle. And until you do meditation on a regular basis, you're not going to be able to discern those subtleties. Until, by the way, you get your emotions under control, you're going to be able to discern those subtleties. Okay. The next is, ask your guardian angel or the guardian angel of your family. He knows what it is. He's dealing with the guy. He sees him. He sees what he's doing to your family. He sees what he's doing to you. So you can ask him, okay, what, what is, you know, show, show me what this actually is. Now, this means, obviously, you have to have a certain devotion to your guardian angel. Most people say, my guardian angel doesn't tell me a thing. When was the last time you talked to him? Never have. Well, there you go. Okay. So the point being is, is that as you, as you work with your guardian angel a lot, they'll likely more likely to give you those inclinations and to do those particular things that are necessary to help you to, to discern this particular thing that's in your family. So you can actually guard an angel, devotion to the saints, etc. One of the primary ones is Our Lady of Sorrows. So, to recount, Our Lady of Sorrows, uh, Our Lady, St. Joseph, took Christ to St. Simeon. St. Simeon said to Our Lady, and it says he prophesied, so prophecy doesn't mean telling the future, although that can be part of it. It primarily means, the term prophecy means speaking on behalf of God. That's what prophecy actually is, not telling the future. So you'll hear people, oh, I've got the gift of prophecy. Really? Really? How accurate is your prophecy? Usually you find out, not very. Okay. Um, sometimes two people are just really good at seeing where things are heading, and so they don't have the gift of prophecy. They're just good at looking causes, and they want to say, well, that's where that's headed. Okay. So... But Our Lady Sarah said, to, so St. Simon said to Our Lady, your soul shall be pierced so that the hearts of many will be laid bare. Now if you unpack that, your heart will be pierced, which means what? The fathers of the church say at that time, that was her first sorrow, because St. Simeon then recounted to her everything her son was going to go through in the Passion. He gave detailed description of he will be put to death, he will be crucified, he will be crowned, he will be flogged, he will be scourged, he, this is, that he will be rejected by the, uh, the, you know, the Jews, etc. He tells her everything that's going to happen. That's why she's the queen of martyrs, by the way. Because from that point on, she carried the pain of knowing that they would reject God through her son. Okay, They would ultimately reject her son. She carried that her entire life. Which is why when it gets to the cross and the passion, you know, she already has a pretty good idea of how it's going to unfold. She's not panicking, running around, saying, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? It's not what's happening. Okay. That, so the first thing is she's going, to, that she's going to go through the passion with Christ. That will merit an intimacy with God that will result in her seeing in Him things that nobody else will see. We do this all the time. There are certain things we will tell our close friends or our family that we will not talk about to other people. And so and the closer they are, the more likely we are to reveal. So in the case of our Lord, she's the, uh, other than the humanity of Christ, she's the most intimate thing, creature in relationship to him, and so he reveals to her. There's nothing that he holds back really from her. Okay. So then, God though, however, will let her reveal those things to us under certain circumstances so that the hearts of many will be laid bare. The heart is something hidden. 
And so she can reveal what's going on. This is why you want to pray to her to reveal to you what is the generational spirit in my family or spirits. And she will reveal them. The way it normally works is, don't go, usually when I tell people, once you kind of haven't paid too much attention to the natural side of things, what you do is you just pray to her. It doesn't have to be long, although doing the novena is good. But you just pray to her every day saying, reveal to me what is the generational spirit of my family. And my experience is, is that usually within a week to two, if you don't already see it, you'll get a grace. It's not the type of thing where you're going to say, well, I think I might have figured it out. That's not how it works in my experience. What will happen is, is all of a sudden, boom, you'll just see it. That's what the problem is in our family. And it will probably be something you've never seen before. About 80% of the time, the people who do this say it was not what they had anticipated it to be. But then they go back and they look and they see it everywhere. In other words, the guy is hiding in plain sight. It's just that you're distracted by all this other stuff and you're not seeing it. So she'll give you the grace, which is enlightening of the mind, to see it. And you'll see it. One of the ways you'll, it'll be verified is you will see it in yourself. It's not just saying, oh, see, our husband has this problem. That's, it. That's not what you're going to see. You're going to see something in yourself that you recognize that's it. And then you'll realize, I have always had a problem in this area because it's generational and it's passed on. You're going to recognize I've pretty much had this my whole life. I've always struggled with this. Whether it's fear or depression um, or intemperance or whatever the case is. Okay, so it will be something which they will, uh, she will reveal that to you. So then once you see it, then we have to, well, in the next conference we'll talk about how you, okay, so how do I, how do I, once I see it, how do I get rid of this guy out of my life, out of our, my family's life, which by the way, generational spirits are extraordinarily stubborn. They're very difficult to get out of a whole generational line. In fact, I've, I've never seen it where they got out of everybody in the line. There's always somebody he manages to hold on to. But there's ways to, to actually deal with that. The other thing you have to remember is, is when you see what, when Our Lady gives you this grace, you're going to immediately recognize all the collateral damage that has resulted from this guy's life in your family. So, for example, I was mentioning last night, the family that had discovered that the generation spirit was a demon of fear, and everybody in the family admitted that they had the problem. And the father, I was using this as an example just a minute ago, the father said, I never had a problem with this, no, it was around her mother. Okay. And, which by the way, he loves her very much, but that's not the question, right? So, what happened is, is once they saw that, that's when the people in the family began to realize that's why the relationships were so difficult, because they were afraid of being hurt by each other. So, the family was very much mafia style. You know, if you attacked the family from the outside, you would get crushed underfoot. But within the family, so they protected each other in the family from the outsiders, but inside they were beating each other silly because of the fact that the fear of, of you know, I might get hurt in this, in, this, in this process of revealing myself or having, you know, that closeness or be willing to suffer that other individual. So there's this fear. So that can be, that's what if you'll just see the collateral damage that ends up happening from it. The fear then can lead to other things. So you'll see, okay, well, this person suffered from depression, and so they gave, they gave in to um, despair because life just never seemed to change, and as a result, that's why they left the faith or things of that sort. So you can find out, because that's his goal is to get him out. So you'll feel fine, you'll start seeing all the causation, you'll see the daughters then. Once you see the, the, root vice or problem, you'll see all the things that flow from it, generally speaking. And it'll make a lot of sense. It'll also make you more benign towards the people in your family. Because you're going to realize that the family's been under attack. So, but the point being is, is that just, you know, just recognize that this guy's in the family life and you can recognize that's why this person engages in this behavior. That's why this person is doing this. So that once you begin to, once you begin to address it, then you can actually um, get him out, okay? The other uh, things to do of obviously leading a good Catholic life, getting a confession record, doing things like that, 
watching what you're confessing on a regular basis, not the main stuff, the stuff that's in the background. Watch for that too. Sometimes it's the stuff right in the again, uh, right in front of you, but usually it's not. So just watching how what you know what you're confessing can be um, generally. The other thing is too is is start taking a look at your motivations for why you're committing these sins. You know why am I, you know why am I always chewing my wife out? Why am I doing that? You know it's not just. It's not just because of the fact that she happens to put her, you know, her, her cup next to the coffee pot or whatever. It has, to, it has to do with something in me. What is it that's driving that? And that'll help you. So the confession can help you to start to sort some of that out. Okay. We're going to stop there. So this is the way you're going to start to discern it. The main thing, though, is Our Lady of Sorrows asking her to reveal. Because you're going to need a grace if you're going to see the clarity of this. And sometimes she will give you a grace to see an event that set it off. Especially if it's the type of thing where the generational spirits don't go back very far. You'll see, oh, well, it was because of this, and then that's when all the problems began. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? Uh, yes? Uh, I haven't just really far on, but basically, um, why... You, okay, so let's say you start to try to discern and go through all these steps... <coughs> And you're not totally successful, maybe you're a little bit successful, quote, mm -hmm. quote, but then the fallout, so, you, you know, after death, and you suffer the rest in purgatory or hell, or, I mean, do, does your efforts, do other people rely on your efforts in the family? Can you kind of bear their suffering and help them, like cousins, brothers, moms? Uh, yeah. Oh, that was a lot. That's one question. <laughs> Do you have to spend time in purgatory in hell? His goal is to get you under him in hell. That's his goal. To get you to fall so that in hell you're under him. In purgatory, you're only going to suffer, you'd only have to spend time in purgatory for anything for which you were complicit in. The degree of the complicity, too. Because sometimes people are affected more than others. Usually the person affected the most is really off the rails. Is very often the person is least culpable. But not always. So you, you kind of have to look at that. Can you help the other cousins and stuff like that? That we're going to talk about how you clean up the generational line because there's very specific things that happen and sometimes you can only clean up your line. You can't clean up their line. You can tell them what the root cause is, but you, but, but you can't necessarily clean up their, their line. So but we'll talk about that in the next conference. Yes? They can't hear your question. My question is, I have, feel like I'm progressing in my spiritual life to where I'm receiving grace over years of prayer and meditation. Right. My question is, is there an hierarchy of grace to where I can be certain about, about the grace I'm receiving and what to expect in the future? Uh, some graces, yes. Some graces, no. Some graces are so subtle we don't really notice it. That's usually why... Um, there's some graces people will just say, you know, ever since I went to confession to this one priest, he gave me this one piece of advice, and after that, I've never had a problem with this. So they know that there's a specific grace that they're receiving at that moment. Other graces that we receive throughout the course of our lives have to be discerned with a spiritual director. In the case of someone who... To practice, to see it in applying virtues in your life and excelling in your virtues along with your spiritual life. Yes. In fact, grace... Because it enlightens the mind and strengthens the will, actually is inclining you towards a virtuous action. So if you're growing in virtue, you know you're growing in grace. So there's an hierarchy of virtues. Yes, there that is. Mirrors grace. Uh, well, the problem is the word grace is a very broad category, and yes, there's there's hierarchies, but that's a whole conference on its own. So to answer your question, yeah, there is, but there's also a hierarchy of, of of virtues as well. So it's an hierarchy of grace, but you don't want to assume it, but practice virtues and you'll be safe. Yes, exactly. Uh, Anne's in control of the mic. <laughs> so you have to get Anne. I just laughed immediately when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you talk about meditation, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people out there who are leery regarding mm -hmm. meditation that it could be something 
maybe it be a culture that would take you away from God. No. Yeah, it's because yeah. Well, discern? well, the basic principle is is this: is meditation collapsed mm -hmm. among the Catholics and the Christians, and then uh, the thing that came in its wake is the New Age movement. So that's usually why when people hear meditation, that's usually what they think. But there's actually talking about Christian meditation, which basically means that you're actually using the uh, your your, your uh, that what determines the meditation in large part. There's also a method, but there's. Uh, but in large part is object of meditation. So in the Christian meditation, you're actually contemplating God, the saints, some perfection in, in them, etc. That, uh, if you want to know, it's a really good uh, book on meditation, it's just called The Ways of Mental Prayer by Lahodi. And he, uh, he's up for canonization, this guy. Um, it's just Ways of Meditation. It's put out by Tan. It's the best book on meditation. It gives you all the structure, all the things that you need to know, etc. What's bad meditation, what's good meditation, etc. Another thing that you can do is, if you don't want to wade all the way through that book, is there's a section from St. Francis de Sales' Devout Life, which is on the internet, which just gives you the structure, basic structure of meditation. So, yes. I have a question on the generational spirits and finding that in your family. We have, a, we adopted six of our eight children. And so, do I know the patterns, and so they have, our children then would have that from their biological families, but then do they also, those children have it from us as well? So are they doubly getting hit? After and, being around you for a while, yes. Yes, lovely. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's so many patterns of children that we got at five months old or, or things are going, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you're this old and, and seeing those things. But so we have to just really, our, our mother's sorrow, like sorrows in the brain for both. For both, for both. You want to find out what the generational spirit is in relationship to the adopted child, the, the adopted parents. Sometimes if you know a bit about the adopted parents, I can tell you. Um, but then you also have to realize you got your own guy hanging around your family and so over the course of time he's got to pick and start picking up those same things the good news is is this god has the demons on a short leash now recently this one priest says because god because the demons are on a short leash if you don't mess with them they won't mess with you and i'm like well he obviously doesn't know a thing about this <laughs> The fact of the matter is, is that, yes, they're on a short leash. Yes, Christ gets determined. That does not mean that Christ keeps them out of your life. He allows them into your life at times for your spiritual betterment. So, uh, or to punish you if you're particularly bad. But the point being is, is that um, because they're on a short leash, usually people don't end up with five generational demons. It's usually one guy that gets the the bag, so to speak. So you have, you have to just discern what's the one that they're primarily dealing with. <laughs> and then that's what you have to address. Yes? Father, do you do masses for getting ne out the generational curses? Next conference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Father, I wanted to pick up a little bit from what you said last night, too, about how generational spirits don't see any races. And yes. uh, so uh, if somebody like myself is uh, fairly new in the Catholic faith, I'm only a second generation Catholic, and uh, my grandparents before me were uh, were pagans. Right. And you were mentioning, like, uh, the Aztecs and the American Indians and whatnot. But, yeah. Uh, so not only that, but I have uh, uh, pagan shamans or priests in my lineage. Mm -hmm. The only thing about it is I know zero, maybe two percent of my, my mom purposely kept that from me. Okay. So my question is, uh, how important is it to know that, or if, is it even important, or to just begin where I know what I can see today? In myself, like you said, start with yourself. Yeah, I, I would say um, that um, unless you're seeing something distinctively that's been passed in your generational line, then I would just focus on 
you know, in other words, because they were engaging in this, these particular problems were seen in the family, and so I have suffered from those problems as well, even though I'm trying to be Catholic. Then I would say, yeah, then you probably might want to get to know a little bit about that, but usually my experience is, is if you just find out who he is, what kind, you know, what kind of spirit he is, so to speak, then from there you can begin applying the, um, the things necessary to get him out without knowing all that other stuff. A lot of times we don't know where this generational thing came from. So this family that had the generational spirit of fear, we, we were able to track it back through his grandfather, but after that, that was it. We couldn't figure out where had it, it had actually come from. So a lot of times you're not going to know this, and you don't need to, you just need to know what his nature is. You know, is it a demon of anger? Is it a demon of what the vice he tends to drive? And then from there, you can um, actually address it. We'll also talk about what, you're gonna, what you can do in relationship to those things in the past to make up for them so that they don't affect, uh, so that God will be benign and give graces to the subsequent generations. Okay. Why do we learn everything way too late? <laughs> uh, because of this reason. We are dumb as a bag of hammers. <laughs> My dad once time he said, look, if love wasn't blind, nobody would get married. But the one thing, uh, the one thing is, the one thing you have to recognize is, is why are we so clueless? Well, it's very simple. One, because of original sin. It says in uh, Psalms that God made us a little less than the angels. And according to the fathers of the church, Adam and Eve's in raw, native and raw intelligence was borderline right underneath the lowest angel. So what does that mean as far as that you're, you're talking somewhere on the magnitude of two to three hundred IQ level that they were originally created with? So, but then of course, and it's kind of funny, there's a thing called genetic entropy, which will, by the way, destroys the idea of, of evolution. But there's a thing called genetic entropy where literally, genetically, each subsequent generation is deteriorating. We're getting dumber. Which is pretty obvious. I mean, I think you can just take, take a look at things. But the thing is, is that what happens is, is in the intellect, when you, when, the, when, when you think of what you're going to do and you think, you know, I could, I could steal the chocolate and eat it, right? But it's stealing, right? But I still want to eat the chocolate. So then you say, so then you steal the chocolate and then eat the chocolate. Okay. Now, what has to happen in this, St. Thomas says, is he says, the will cannot choose evil as such. It has to choose evil under the aspect of the good. In order to do that, in order for us to commit the sin, which is choosing the evil under the aspect uh, of the good, the will has to move the intellect to ignore or remove from what you're considering the thing that's evil. You don't think to yourself, but this is that. When you're actually choosing it, you're choosing what, to take the, to, to get the, to eat the, the, the chocolate, not I'm choosing to steal. That's not what you're doing. That result is, is the minute you move the intellect to do that, you're moving it contrary to its nature. Because its nature is to recognize the truth of it and you're telling it, ignore the truth so that I can choose this thing. The definition of violence is action contrary to the nature of a thing. Every time you choose it, every time you choose that, so it's action contrary to the nature thing, the principal effect of violence is you weaken the thing. So every time you sin, you get dumber. All of us do, right? Okay. But going back to your observation, there's also demons of oppression. And what do they do? It's true that some of it is psychological. We just learn this, right? Well, the type of the father basically teaches the daughter, this is what masculinity is. That's what it is. And so when she sees it in her father, now some, some women are, are, will look at it and say, my father was a mess, I'm not going anywhere near that, okay. But sometimes they don't, they just, they recognize this, it's called implicit, implicit learning, we just make these associations un unconsciously. And so then when we go to see some, uh, you know, when we see somebody, then it picks up on this. This, this is a type. This is a man, right? So this is the type of guy that I should pursue, unconsciously. Okay. But there's also a thing called oppression. The demons can actually, if, if you have a generational spirit in your life, he can move people outside of you and outside your generational line 
who have those same problems because he's got power over them to get into your life. That's what Deacon ends up doing. The first time I recognized this was there was a woman who was possessed by a demon of fear and the fear, she, the, the demon used the men around her to cause her damage to become wounded so that she become more fearful so she could gain more power over her. And so that's why he drove that cycle of her going from guy to guy to guy to guy so that he, she just keep getting wounded and more wounded. Okay. The point being is, is this, it, and so it's a demon of oppression when they move the, the people from the outside to cause us damage or for us to get into their life. So that's something that we need to, you know, you need to be aware of. Just say, okay, you know, this is a demon of oppression. This demon is going to drive people, these, these same people with these same kinds of problems to be, want to be part of my life. And I have to just be very careful about it. And see, if I see that this person has a problem with alcohol, Sorry, bud. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how good looking you are. I don't care any other attribute you have. I, I can't be around that. Okay. Next question. I never knew that that wand made you so powerful. <laughs> Since we do not have um, the exorcism and baptism anymore, is there any uh, way that it's still part of the new rite of baptism. The problem is, is most priests skip it. <laughs> yeah. In which case, then, okay, you can say, if, if you start to see this pattern in your children, <coughs> get them to a priest who can say the prayers with them to see if you can get it broken. So he can still say those baptisms. You can say the prayers. Uh, you can still, you can still, the priest can say those prayers that would have been said at baptism and they could still be effective. No, once the baptism ritual is completed, he can't go back. So the only time I've ever seen it permitted is in case of possession where the bishop gave specific faculties to a priest to use them. But I've never seen them actually solve the problem either once they're, now they do solve the problem at, at, if it's done during the baptism very often. But not, it's not. It's a subsequent, in other words, subsequently, the bishops are virtually never give permission. I've only seen it once. So you just have to, you have to take other means. So you ask the priest, you go to the priest to ask him to pray the, what? He's going to have to do some other kind of person deliverance over the children. We'll talk about that in the next conference, because I'm going to talk about what you can get from a priest as far as helping you get this guy out of your life. If a priest has discerned witchcraft, sorcery, and divination in the ancestry, what else do you have to do about that? Um, keep your kids away from the metaphysical section in libraries. No. Um, yeah, again, we'll talk about more about that in the next conference because there's um, each individual sphere has its own sets of things you have to do. Father, on that previous question about baptism, most of the Catholic churches today, the baptisms are done by the deacon. Right. Who's usually a uh, lay person. Do they have the power of saying the exorcism? They do, yes. The value as a priest? Yes. But it would be more clear to people if they understood the actual history of the church and the minor orders. Once you have one of the orders, like the major orders, you have all the other orders. So we know that the priesthood uh, is the is a major order. And then the diaconate is underneath it. But then there's actually five more underneath that. There's the subdiaconate. Which is designed specifically to serve at the altar underneath the deacon to assist the deacon. But then there's also the um, uh, acolyte. This is one of the things that's a bit of a difficulty. I was having this discussion within the confines of my community. Um, and this is an actually very interesting question. Acolyte, um, 
Lecter, Exorcist, uh, and then uh, Porter. What the church used to do is before you could receive any of these minor, the minor orders are here, these are the minor orders, although sometimes this, the subdiacon was considered a major order, primarily because that's when you contracted originally, that's when you contracted the obligation of celibacy. But before you become a poor, they did they have what they call tonsure. And why am I going into all this? Because I think it'll help you to see something, which I think the church will restore eventually. There's already been some discussion um, among some of the theologians and the necessity. So once the theologians really start signing off on something, it's a matter of time before it works its way up. Okay. Tonsure is basically they cut your hair. That's what it basically means. But in that, it's the technical term, uh, technical phrase for that ritual is the order of making a cleric. What this is, this is where you went from being a layman to a cleric, not the diaconate. It was done originally here. And once you became a cleric, it meant you, you were rendered a sacred person. That meant that once you were rendered a sacred person, you could then receive the sacred orders. But not before then. What they did is they decided to do away with all, all of the minor orders. And now they have what they call ministries. So they receive the ministry of lector and acolyte. The ministries the church has ruled recently are not the same thing as orders. Ministries is the permission to do something with, to, to, it's the ability to do something without gaining further permission. It's not an actual office that you receive that changes you in some way. So, you cannot repeat these until you get them. Now, Exorcist was one of them. Historically, up until the, uh, around the Council of Trent, when they basically forbid the minor order of exorcists, those who had that, they could not exercise that. It's what they call a, a, a bound power, potes legata. It's, it's bound, so you can't use it unless under certain circumstances. So what they did is, they, the exorcists in the early church literally did what I do, exorcise people who are possessed. But then they eventually made it said, no, only priests can do this now. This is at the Council of Trent. But once you receive any, once you receive the diaconate, de facto, all of these are included. So they have them. But here's the kick. Because they did away with this in the new rite, what happens is, is each time you go through this, these orders... You're going through a ritual where the bishop is asking for you to receive specific graces for that order. As a result of that, when you get to the diaconate, do you have all the orders? Yes, but you don't. And do you have the grace of those orders? Yes, but you don't have the grace of the ritual of going through the orders. This is a significant thing. I actually had a case of possession where the demon, or the woman when she was possessed, would manifest could tell which priest had gone through it and which hadn't. So it's one of those things that you're just like, mm. so the point being is um, they used to do this originally. So the deacon, because the deacon actually has, contains the order of exorcism. When he does the exorcism, it's with the actual permission of the church. And so it's a sacramental. And so it has the, it has the, it has the effect. So, in fact, in theory, it's possible for the deacon's exorcism to be more efficacious than the priest, because the deacon could actually be more holy. And so when you say in the prayers, it can have more effect. On the other hand, the level of order also has an impact on that as well. But the point being is, is because he has the diaconate, he also contains the order of exorcism, so he can actually, so that's why the church allows him to say those prayers. So it should have its effect. In fact, I've never seen it say, well, all this because of is a deacon, and that's why I got to stick around. You never hear demons talking that way. So well, if most families have some kind of generational spirit and our families are coming apart, why don't all parish priests have the order of exorcism? Well, they do, by virtue of the fact that they were ordained to the diaconate. So they all have faculties that they have oh, no. exorcism? Order and faculties are two different things. The order is the power which is distinct from the right to make use of that power. Why don't they have the right? Because the church restricts it. And the reason they restrict it is because, uh, and I've seen this, uh, a lot of priests would do a lot of really stupid things. And you'd end up with a lot of damage, which I've seen. 
So the, that's why they restricted it to the Council of Trent as well, to make sure that the priests who were doing it were doing it properly. So instead of having the help, we don't have the help because... Because yeah. priests are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Really? I mean, that's what it boils down to. I mean, I hate to be so frank about it, but that's the nature of it. So, in fact, one of the reasons we started this society is because of the fact that, um, uh, we were trying to start the one of these as a society, is because of the fact that there's a lot of dioceses that just don't have a priest that's adequate. Because you have to know, you, have, you should have some knowledge of Latin. You have to have a general sense of how this stuff works. You have to have common sense, which a lot of priests don't have. You have to have um, basic common sense, and you also have to have a pretty decent understanding of the spiritual life. And you also have to have a certain level of prayer life to do this, which narrows it down to, you know, maybe 1% or 2% of a, di a large diocese. So, yes? Um, I wanted to ask uh, what you thought about Father Armwart and what he said about the changes that were done to the exorcism, the words, oh, yeah. and the effectiveness in the week that... They, they were weakened? Yes. Uh, okay. Father Amorth actually is considered, although he, he considers Father Candide, the, um, who is his mentor, um, who's also up for canonization at the moment. I think he's a venerable already. Maybe. Servant of God, I think. I mean, Father Candide was the mentor to Father Amorth. But a lot of the exorcists consider Father Amorth kind of like the father of modern exorcism. Because he was the guy that really transitioned it through that time in which the church just gave up on it. He was still doing it, right? And then he managed through his books and through his talking, he managed to bring it back to some degree. So they all considered him the father of uh, modern exorcists. Uh, exorcists. Um, as to his observations about the new rite of exorcism, yes and no. I'm a tad more benign, ironically, I'm a traditional priest, but I'm a tad more benign to it than most. Is it less effective than the, new, than the old rite? Generally, generally speaking, yes. And the principal reason is, is for two reasons. One, he's right. There was no exorcist, trained exorcist on the panel that put the thing together. And, and you can tell it, you know. You're starting, you start this exorcism, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, it says, okay, now you stop and you bless the water. Excuse me? The thing is sticking to the ceiling. You don't have time for that. That should have been done before you even walked in the room, right? So in other words, the, 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 it just didn't, doesn't want to written well. The other side of it is, too, is that there's two kinds of prayers, deprecatory, even, and then impetratory. Prayers. Deprecatory prayers is where you petition something from God. So you ask, Christ, Christ, would you please grant this? Impetratory is where you command something. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to depart. Okay. What they did is they removed almost all of this in the new rites. It's there. But there's only like two prayers that it's, that it's done, if I remember correctly. The rest is all deprecatory. The second thing is, in the impetratory stuff, they drastically reduced the, uh, the force of the prayer. Prayer begets what it signifies. What you ask for is what you get. So like an example is, in the old rite of, of exorcism, there's a section where you're literally, you're literally, you know, it, it's literally, um, um, by the power of God the Father I command you by the power of the Holy by the power of the Son of God I command you by the power of the Holy Spirit I command you by the power of His incarnation I command you and you're just like hammering this thing right through these constant commands based on various things in the new rite they removed a lot of that the second thing is that they they also removed um, certain things where uh, a lot of diagnostic stuff was removed so for example and then I'll talk about why I'm a bit more benign towards it. But the other thing that they did is that they removed is things like there were sections where you, you know, um, causa infidia. You'd go through this whole thing where you were literally naming the things that Satan was guilty of, right? So, you know, the cause of envy, the insider of lust, the insider, you, know, you just, of incest. You just go down this whole list of all this stuff that he was guilty of. And when the demon would ping on something, react to it, that's when you know it's okay. There's something about this that t tells me something about this guy, and then you can hone in onto it. They removed a lot of that in the new right. However, I'm a bit more benign to it because there are some cases where certain demons, it's not too common, 
maybe two to three percent of the cases where he will actually re he will actually react more to the new right than to the old. And the reason being is because he's more sensitive to the deprecatory prayers. The deprecatory prayers in there are pretty decent. My theory is, is what they should have done is just kept the old right of uh, old ritual and then put what they call chapter, we call it chapter four, added another chapter where they added prayers that they, that exorcists have known over the course of the last three, four hundred years are very efficacious and just added those and say these may be used ad limitum, that is whenever you want to. That's what they should have done instead of just completely reconstructing the rite. The other thing is too is <clears throat> the rite of exorcism that we have originally began with the Jews, and then it was a, then parts of it were used by the Catholics, and then it was amplified and perfected, and it was codified in 595. So we're talking literally thousands of years of its development. Then it went under some minor development again for about another a thousand years. <coughs> About 900 years. You are out of your mind if you think that a group of people who know nothing about this are going to come up with a better ritual in the course of a few months than it took the church thousands of years to fashion. I'm sorry, but that's just raw arrogance. So, now, but again, I've used it once in a while. I don't use it. What I'll do is, is because it's on limited to me, you can use sections. I don't do the blessing part in there. I've already got my water blessed. But what I do is, is I'll use the other deprecatory prayers as a diagnostic tool, and sometimes they work. They work actually better. But it's it's in a rare case. Generally speaking, they respond much more to the old. Okay. Yes. By the way, that's a whole conference on itself. Yeah. It's prayer and fasting, not sacrifice. Yeah. Fasting, yeah. yeah. Fasting. Um, does that just involve the priest? And no, that can even be the lady. That's one of the things we're going to talk about, how to get your generational spirit out of. Yeah. Because you mentioned that there was a degree of holiness that mattered with the priest. And That's right. Um, so how yes. Do you, how do you kind of keep away like, the cult of personality around the priest and the people? And how do you keep... uh, well, the way the priest does it is he doesn't have much contact with the people. That's one of the ways. But as far as you mean, are you talking about in terms of um, the exorcist to the person he's exercising? Um, what you have to do is immediately you have to establish a very professional relationship, which means you don't call me in the middle of the night and want to talk to me about your hangnails. You know, I will see you next week. Keep track of what's going on. So in other words, it, it, it's like a doctor. You have to see, you have to set up this structure that it's very similar to being like a doctor, so that they know that they um, how you deal with them is um, it's on a professional level and it's not going to go any further. I mean, they'll obviously notice that you have a certain level of compassion, and there is a, it's it's like anything else. You know, they talk about how guys who go off to war and fight together, they become close friends, right? It's the same thing here. You, there is a kind of bond that ends up developing as a result of that, but it just has to be kept uh, uh, under kind of a certain reserve. So, the other thing is, too, is most of the people that I've worked with and I've liberated in the past, I, I haven't talked to them since. And I usually don't. I usually just tell them, look, as soon as you clean up, it's time for you to move on, you know? So, whereas if, you're, if, you're, if you want to be talking to me or talking to the people that helped me, etc., for long periods of time, you haven't moved on. And you've got to put this thing in the past and move on. So, okay. We will stop there. Uh, if you have any questions, you can keep track of them because uh, later tonight we will use, uh, talk about, I'll give you a chance to ask them. Okay. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. If you're capable of kneeling. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus sanctions super vos et manet semper. Amen. Amen.